In 2009, Mirage Studios announced that their next theatrical release would be a live-action movie. This movie would eventually become known as the 2014 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. However, the movie we got was almost the complete opposite of what was initially promised. To make things even weirder, fans were at war with the movie by the time Michael Bay's Platinum Dunes took over the project. Their fears were confirmed when a draft of the script leaked. Today, I'll explore the story of that script, known as The Blue Door, and how its leak changed the course of the movie. I've talked about this before, but coinciding with the 25th anniversary of the Turtles in 2009, a new theatrical reboot was announced to be produced by Galen Walker and Scott Mednick. Ninja auditions even took place during the anniversary events, and writer John Fusco was brought in to adapt the first 10 or so issues of the Mirage run. This was fresh after the release of The Dark Knight, so Batman Begins was mentioned as an inspiration for the new take on the franchise. Unfortunately, Mirage Studios sold the Turtles to Paramount, meaning certain projects like TMNT Back to the Sewer got cancelled in favor of a new TV show. However, the movie simply changed hands, as it was too early in development and could still be altered to whatever Paramount wanted to produce. Iron Man writers Art Markham and Matt Holloway were brought in to co-write the script with Fusco. By mid-2010, Paramount wasn't happy with the script, as they considered it too edgy. They decided to bring in Michael Bay's company, Platinum Dunes, to produce the film, now with an expected release in 2012. It's safe to assume that a new script was commissioned, and the new writers, Josh Applebaum and Andrew Nemec, had to start from scratch. In February 2012, Jonathan Liebsman was selected as the film's director over Brett Ratner. The release date was pushed to Christmas 2013, but this was when the story started getting messier. In March 2012, Michael Bay talked about the movie at Nickelodeon's upfront event for partners and clients of the network. Bay pitched the film by saying that the Turtles were from an alien race, and therefore, the new movie was simply titled Ninja Turtles. As you can imagine, this made the fans run for their pitchforks. Ignoring the fact that its quirky title helped the franchise rise to popularity in the first place, there were other concerns, especially that audiences were growing tired of Michael Bay's productions. Peter Laird, the Turtles co-creator, considered making the Turtles alien both a dumb and genius idea. He explained that over the years, the idea of a fifth turtle always came up, an idea they had always shut down, as it would have made the four brothers less unique. But having a whole race of turtleoids would have given the writers enough excuses to create all the turtles they wanted. In case this wasn't clear enough, he was against it. Perhaps because of the backlash from fans, creators, and former actors of the franchise, Paramount decided to shut down production in June and push back the release to May 2014. The reason for the shutdown may have actually been related to script and budget concerns. Michael Bay asked the fans to chill and take a breath. After all, they hadn't read the script yet, and they were planning on including everything that made them fans of the Turtles in the first place. Furthermore, director Jonathan Liebsman locked himself in a room with Kevin Eastman, the other Turtles co-creator, to get things right. Regarding the alien nature of the Turtles, Liebsman clarified that it was the ooze that was of alien origin, and the premise of the movie was still in drafts. Things were starting to go back to normal until August 2012, when the fan blog TMNT, not TANT, leaked a script dated January 2012, and fans ran for the pitchforks again. I'll talk more about the context of this particular version of the script later in this video, but what you need to know is that it coincides not only with what Michael Bay said in March of that year, but also had a similar format to the first Transformers movie. It follows Casey Jones, a factory security guard who runs into four turtle warriors who are being chased by a black ops army trying to invade the world. Too much? Well, I'll explore the script now. Since there's nothing interesting to show while discussing the draft, you can listen to this video as if it were a podcast. I'll play this sound when you should look back at the screen. Let's proceed. The story begins on a late winter night in a waterfront warehouse at the Brooklyn Naval Yard. The military surrounds an enormous steel kennel with live subjects inside. Having succeeded in the operation, Colonel Schrader had asked General Davies to put Substation 16 back online to take the captured subjects there. 
After all, this was the reason he'd started Project Ares 20 years ago, just in case this day would come. We then cut to a hockey rink in Noah Falls, Michigan, focusing on Casey Jones, an 18-year-old rookie player who starts a brawl against the opposing team. After the game, Casey's surprised by April O'Neil, an ex-girlfriend from high school who had left Noah Falls for a better life in New York, where she got a fancy internship. She's on a semester break and wants to see Casey. Unfortunately, their moment's interrupted by two local girls who want to take Casey out to celebrate the win. But Casey's more than a simple hockey player. He works as a security guard at a large furniture parts factory at night. He lives with his mom, Evelyn, who's a nurse and a widow. Before leaving for work, Casey prepares dinner for his mom and saves some for himself for later. Casey's mom knows that April's back in town and tries to convince Casey to follow her to New York and experience the bigger world. After all, all his childhood friends have already left town, and only Casey stayed behind. Casey, however, dismisses her advice and heads to work. At work, Casey listens to the radio news about natural disasters in Central Europe. The night goes as expected until a surprise shipment arrives at 4 a.m. It's an undercover lieutenant bringing some, quote, foam cushions from Pittsburgh. The back of the truck is filled with Colonel Schrader and his operatives, known as the Foot. In the center, they have the large metal kennel. One of the Foot hacks Casey's system to fool him and let them in. But Casey senses something's off. After hearing strange noises, he checks on the delivery truck and finds Colonel Schrader opening a secret substation. He returns to his office, and after seeing the truck drive away, he tries to take note of the license plate. Unfortunately, it immediately changes to a Florida plate. Imagine his surprise to see this high-tech truck also cover its own tracks. Something is definitely wrong. Under the factory lies substation 16, an old Cold War bunker refurbished with high-tech equipment. Working for someone named Krang, Schrader asks his team to start with a smaller subject and the rest are put in a separate room. With the lines down, Casey finds himself unable to call for help. And then, with the worst timing in the world, April appears in her pajamas. She couldn't sleep without telling Casey she wanted him to move to New York with her. Apparently, the two had promised each other they would move to the Big Apple back when they were young. But that was also when Casey didn't have to take care of his widowed mother. Frustrated, April leaves. But Casey has too much on his plate at the moment. With the lights flickering, he decides to go down and investigate what's happening underground. Meanwhile, Colonel Schrader confirms that the creature has the DNA they were looking for, and therefore, Project Ares was a success. They're now ready to start the invasion. He then asks the foot to terminate the subjects. And speaking of which, Casey runs into the other three subjects, enormous turtles standing nearly six and a half feet tall, rippling with muscles. According to the script, they are recognizable to fans, but completely different. After snatching Casey's watch, the turtles use it to free themselves from their shackles. Don't ask me how. If this wasn't shocking enough, the moment Casey hears the turtles speak leaves him completely overwhelmed. But Casey has no time to waste. The foot are coming in waves to kill the turtles, and it looks like he freed them. While protecting him from the foot, Casey leads them to find Mikey. After rescuing Mikey, the turtles display some of their most unusual abilities, like deflecting bullets with their shells. On their way out, they steal an 18-wheeler and drive down an icy hillside. After a prolonged fight, they find refuge in an abandoned barn. At the barn, Leo's worried about contacting Splinter, who must be out of his mind with concern. Mikey tries to explain what he heard about Project Ares and an incoming invasion but Leo dismisses it as part of Mikey's wild imagination. After Casey confuses them for aliens, Leo gives them their origin story. They were born as regular turtles, four orphans living in the sewers below New York, until one day they were doused with radioactive ooze from a chemical spill. Splinter, a regular rat, found them and took them in. Slowly, the ooze affected all of them. They stayed underground, training with Splinter in the art of ninjutsu, only coming out at night to protect the city from muggers and thieves for 17 years. After that, the turtles open a communication channel with Splinter, prompting them to return home immediately before the connection drops. Unfortunately, the transmission's intercepted by a foot soldier, 
allowing Trader to triangulate the receiver's exact location. The turtles gear up by putting on black headbands. Using tools they find at the barn, Raphael makes new weapons. Two steel-shafted nunchaku for Mikey, two ninja ken with scabbards for Leo, a bow staff for Donnie, and a pair of scythes for himself. Leo convinces Casey to come with them, as they need a human liaison to get to New York and because he now needs to stay safe from the foot. Casey accepts but asks them to change their headbands as he has trouble differentiating them. He makes new headbands for them using a striped blanket, giving them their characteristic colors. But Casey can't return to his truck, and their only way back to New York is with April. He intercepts her before she leaves and asks her to take him to New York and show him what he's missing. While doing this, the turtles get themselves inside the U-Haul. After saying goodbye to his mom, they hit the road. In the back, Donnie searches the internet and the dark web for Project Ares. He discovers it's a military proposal submitted by Colonel Schrader 17 years ago to research mutagens and altered species. Despite the revelation, Raf still feels tired of his brothers and looks forward to living alone. Raf's antipathy for their cause leads Leo to start a fight with them. Casey tries to disguise the rattling by playing folk rock on the radio, and at their next stop, asks them to calm down and feeds them some convenience store pizza from a gas station. April listens to news about rock slides killing thousands in Thailand through the radio, continuing the mysterious natural disaster reports. After that, they hear an explosion behind them, and the U-Haul starts moving on its own, driving next to the car. April sees the turtles for the first time, and to her surprise, realizes Casey knows they're there. The cause of the explosion is the foot, who are now chasing them on high-tech motorcycles. In the middle of the fight, Leo and Mikey move Casey and April to an above-ground subway train car. The other turtles join them just before the train goes underground. The battle continues, and April stays mad at Casey throughout. Sent by Schrader, Bebop and Rocksteady blew up the way to the turtle's lair, an abandoned pre-war era sewer control room. Splinter then started to fight them to defend his home. Back at the subway tunnel, the fight moves to the train as Schrader, now wearing steel claws, joins the fight against the turtles. When the turtles need to jump off at their stop, Raphael realizes Schrader's blood is blue. To give his brothers an advantage, he sends Leo away and stays to fight Schrader. Unfortunately, Schrader has an ace up his sleeve. Blades, actually, coming out from all over his body. Raph pins Schrader to the train with his sigh and escapes. Schrader's clearly not human, something evident when part of his facial skin is gone, revealing pale yellow skin underneath with red eyes and jagged bladed teeth. The other turtles arrive in time to save Splinter. April tries recording the fight for CBS News, but her attempt ends shortly after dropping her phone. Raph returns just in time, and after a short grenade explosion, Bebop and Rocksteady are left behind under the debris. They escape to a rooftop where Splinter starts asking questions about Schrader. After learning he isn't human, he meditates. That's when Mikey nicknames the guy Shredder. Splinter reveals that Schrader and his infiltrators are not from this world, but from Dimension X, a parallel dimension that exists concurrently in time and space with Earth. These two dimensions are meshing, intermittently crashing against each other, creating portals and causing widespread destruction. The natural disasters in the news are signs of the point of contact between the two worlds. These are probably intensifying at the convergence point where Schrader's planning his invasion. To figure out the convergence point, they need access to meteorological data, which April can access thanks to CBS's satellites. Meanwhile, at the waterfront warehouse, Schrader returns to find they've lost track of Bebop and Rocksteady. At the lair, the two mutants are simply not answering their radios, afraid of Schrader's rage but Rocksteady finds April's phone on the floor and figures out that her working for CBS is the key to finding the turtles. Having some good news to report, they answer the call. Casey, April, and the turtles make their move into the CBS building to get to the server room, but the foot arrives at the scene, and Schrader orders them to lock down the building. During their mission, they cross paths with April's co-workers, and that's how Casey finds out that April's unpaid internship is more about serving tea than reporting. The duo makes it to the server room just in time, thanks to the turtles, and they get them inside to do their investigation. 
Donnie discovers that the four anomalies will converge in Alphabet City, right over the power grid in a few hours. On their way, the whole building rumbles, and they run into an elevator shaft filled with flora from another world, with a waterfall from above ending in frigid waters. They all jump and end up in a Dimension X jungle. There they start walking toward what looks like a way back to their dimension, a sewer tunnel flickering in and out of existence, which would have made for an interesting Super Mario meme. Leo looks back and sees one of his brothers go down. Worried, he asks Casey and April to keep walking towards the tunnel as he goes back to check. But when they arrive at the down turtle, they discover he's none of them. This turtle warrior is a native, and he knows their names because they're part of a prophecy. The turtle warrior has a gaping wound on his stomach and has been fighting for 20 years, waiting for the four brothers to return. He reveals that the ooze story is a lie. They come from a city in Dimension X inhabited by beings like them. They were lied to to be protected from a brutal dictator, Krang. In this version, Krang looks like a brain inside a metallic android suit with four arms. When the turtles were hatchlings, five turtle shamans saw a prophecy within them that they would one day defeat Krang. Their parents left them under the care of their trusted friend, Master Splinter, to hide them on Earth and train them for the day of the prophecy. Their parents died with honor, facilitating their escape. But Krang killed them and took a sample of their DNA with hopes of finding the exact turtles that could take him down. For the past 20 years, Krang has been building a war machine, the Technodrome, to crush the rebellion and claim total rule over Dimension X. Dimension X doesn't have enough energy to fuel the Technodrome, which is why he's merging the two dimensions and why the convergence point is over a power grid in Alphabet City. With a charged Technodrome, he would unbind the planets and return to Dimension X triumphant. He then revealed that he was one of four turtle warriors, coincidentally like the four points on Earth where the natural disasters were taking place. These four warriors were like family, and they protected four orbs that stabilized the planet. His brothers were killed by Krang, and while he survived, he failed to defend his orb. He had to stop Krang from getting the four orbs. But now that the turtles were here, it was their destiny to stop Krang and halt the merging. The turtle warrior leads the turtles to the Technodrome, and after reaching a giant statue of a turtle warrior, he retrieves four weapons for them, left there by their father. Coincidentally, they're the same types of weapons they were using before, but they're more refined. The turtle warrior leaves them to face Krang, but that's when Dimension X starts dissolving. Back in New York, the turtles reunite with Splinter, April, and Casey on a rooftop. The turtles resent Splinter for making them think of themselves as monsters all those years. Considering what his mom had to go through, Casey advocates for Splinter, saying it's hard to be a single parent. Krang reunites the four orbs, and Dimension X starts merging with Earth. This transforms the city altogether, with the Technodrome now as part of the city skyline. Krang scouts find the turtles who are ready to fight, but Splinter asks them to go stop the Technodrome while he stays behind to deal with the scouts. After all, this is his destiny. He then transforms his stick into a three-sectional staff. The Turtles, April, and Casey go on a frenetic foot race across the city's rooftops from Midtown Manhattan to Alphabet City. Once there, the Turtles let April and Casey deal with shutting down the power station while they infiltrate the Technodrome. Splinter would have fallen in battle if not for the timely return of the Turtle Warrior and a group of Turtle Rebels. Casey tries to take down the power, but immediately calls the attention of Schrader, Bebop, and Rocksteady. April asks General Davies to protect Casey, and during the attack, some cooling pipes get punctured and gallons of coolant start flooding the area at their feet. Casey successfully shuts down the station right after non-fatally electrocuting Schrader, Bebop, Rocksteady, and the clan exposing the Shredder's true alien form in the process. Inside the Technodrome, the Turtles free the orbs from Krang. Taking advantage of the power failure, the four brothers launch the ultimate attack on Krang, and Leo ends up impaling him. This coincides with an army missile attack on the Technological Fortress. The Turtles take the four orbs and go on their separate paths to unmerge the two worlds. As a result, the Technodrome disappears from the New York skyline. Back in Dimension X, the Technodrome is burning and the Rebels are celebrating. The Turtle Warrior searches for Splinter, but he was left behind on Earth. 
In New York, General Davies, after seeing the alien Schrader and his henchmen, orders them to be put in a metal kennel and taken to Substation 23. In the aftermath, Splinter tells the Turtles they need to put the orbs back in their rightful places in the four corners of Dimension X. The only way to take them to Dimension X is by taking them to their corresponding resting places on Earth. Once in place, they would end up in Dimension X and wouldn't be able to come back. Defeating Krang was only half of the prophecy. The other half was protecting the orbs, just like the four turtle warriors did before them. This means that the turtles will stop being a family and become adults. Donnie will go east, Leo west, Mikey north, and Raph south. Once finished, they will be given trainees to craft into worthy soldiers. The situation resonates with Casey, who is also told to move on earlier in the movie. Despite making such a big deal about wanting to live alone, Raph doesn't want to be separated from his brothers. In the end, April becomes an independent journalist at Channel6.com. Donnie puts his orb back onto the Eiffel Tower, Raph ends up in the Amazon jungle, and after placing the orb, three turtle trainees appear for him to train. Mikey goes to the Arctic Tundra, where he spots his trainees, one of them being a smoking hot turtle girl. Lastly, in the Moroccan desert, Leo starts training the next generation of turtle warriors. Splinter moves to a new dwelling where he tapes pictures of his four sons, and Casey finally moves in with April in New York. It's promised that at some point in the future, the turtles will reunite again in Dimension X. After the script was leaked by a blog famous for hating anything by Michael Bay, some people had their doubts about its authenticity. However, when Paramount sent a cease and desist to the blog, asking them to take down the script, it became clear that this was indeed copyrighted material. There were also scenes and plots in the script that were later reused in the 2014 movie and its sequel, which gives the script even more validity. Michael Bay had to go public again to clarify the origins of the script. He explained that while Platinum Dune signed up to take on the movie in 2010, it took them two years to complete the deal. This meant that the leaked script was worked on before his production company became involved. Despite this, Michael Bay promoted the movie by stating that the Turtles came from an alien race. The two writers of that script remained with Platinum Dunes, joined by another writer, Evan Dougherty. After reading the leaked script, Peter Laird felt relieved that he no longer owned the Turtles and didn't have to fix this mess. On the other hand, Kevin Eastman was already involved with the ongoing production of the movie so he was familiar with the newer script that focused more on April O'Neil. He was also pleased with the movie coming out in May 2014, which would coincide with the Turtles' 30th anniversary. Of course, the film got delayed again and came out in August instead. In any case, Kevin worked with them behind the scenes, providing sketches, drawings, and character designs. But it's clear that his main role was to calm down the fans and ensure them that the movie didn't depart too much from source material. A fictionalized recount of these events can be found in Kevin Eastman's comic, Drawing Blood, where producer Morgan Harbour brings the radically rearranged Ronan Ragdoll's co-creator, Shane Bookman, to do PR for his upcoming movie and ease the fans. You should definitely check out that story, which is currently being published by Image Comics. By February 2013, Michael Bay announced that Megan Fox was joining the production as April O'Neil, which probably ignited the fire of his haters as the leaked script already felt too much like a Transformers movie. Nevertheless, the movie came out in 2014, and despite not being acclaimed by critics, it became the highest grossing TMNT movie of all time, not adjusted for inflation of course. Much has been said about this draft of the script, which I don't think would have been a bad movie. Perhaps an entertaining non-TMNT blockbuster movie. As a Ninja Turtles movie, it simply retconned too much to the point where it could have been used for an original concept. This problem extends to the Shredder who got butchered to the point where he could have been a brand new character. In the first act, Shredder mentioned that without the turtles in the way, they would be ready to start the invasion. I think this line was added so that Mikey could hear about the invasion. But in the end, it was the gathering of the orbs that needed to happen for the invasion to occur. Another critique was how much it focused on Casey Jones. But I think this is only a problem during the first act, and that would have been roughly 15 minutes without Turtles. In the end, I appreciate that Casey had some character development in this script, even if we practically lost him as a protagonist by the third act. 
Removing elements from the origin story, especially the Japanese roots, is always problematic. This draft never explored why this race used ninjutsu and why the turtles were named after four renaissance artists. It also started a trend in TMNT movies, ignoring the Hamato Yoshi and Oroku Saki feud. I have to assume that this became a thing because writers didn't feel comfortable tackling plots about a culture they didn't know well, which could easily lead to the writing of stereotypical characters. However, this has never been a problem for the cartoons and comic books. Interesting, isn't it? If it were up to me and I had to keep the turtles as aliens, I would have changed the origin to make them the last four survivors of their race and simply fulfill their destiny of stopping Krang from taking over the world. In this way, the turtles would have kept their uniqueness and remained together at the movie's end. One interesting plot line in this script was the idea that the turtles were raised as freaks of nature until they found out there were others like them, and therefore they weren't the monsters they thought they were. This was a deviation from the other versions of the turtles, where they simply had to convince others that they were the good guys. It's a fascinating difference, as it gives the turtles all the reasons to finally belong to a race, something that in later installments they would have had to fight against so they could return home. In any case, given that Michael Bay kept the same writers from this script and announced to the world the turtles were aliens, it would be safe to assume that, if it hadn't been for the fan outcry, the movie would have kept the alien element. What are your thoughts about this draft and this origin? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching, see you in the sewers.